Hello and welcome to the Wedding Dish Podcast. Grab your fork and knife and take a seat at our table as we dish on all things weddings. You'll hear stories and tips from real couples and wedding pros about love, life, and entrepreneurship. I'm Sarah Alipin, your host of The Wedding Dish and CEO of Photos from the Hardy and District Bliss. Today, we do have our little French bulldog buddy, Clouseau, in his podcasting chair. He is uh, looking at the front door like we might be getting mail, so you might hear him sing the song of his people. And... (laughs) Before we get started, if you haven't listened to last week's episode, go back and check it out. There's tons of great info there, and you're going to get tons of great info in today's as well. Today, we are talking with a passionate money coach dedicated to transforming financial lives, the human behind our green life, Prisca Benson. Thank you so much for joining me on The Wedding Dish today. Thank you for having me, Sarah. I am really excited to talk with you about money and finances and how it doesn't have to feel overwhelming and stressful and how we can be smart about it. Agreed. I like to make money feel like less of an intimidating topic. Yeah, and it is, it can be an intimidating topic. So, you know, we tackle the hard conversations here too. All right. Well, I'm ready. (laughs) Yes. Um, so what are some of the most common money mistakes that couples make when planning their wedding? They severely underestimate how much your wedding is actually going to cost them, right? So they don't have a realistic budget from the beginning. And then the emotions of it all lead to overspending, blowing past the initial budget. So ideally, um, you really want a realistic number just challenging to do because, you know, some vendor things and price hikes and inflation, all these things can happen. But not only do you want to create a, a, a budget that's realistic, like make sure you have all your line items listed and how much you expect to pay for each, but also give yourself room for error. OK, so maybe give yourself like 15 to 20 percent extra to cover the things that inevitably go wrong. OK. <laughs> things go wrong. <laughs> and that way too, like if um, like if something comes up, like maybe like a vendor cancels and then you need to get another one, like you have the the room in there to, to pay the extra if you need to. Yeah. And I mean, you don't have to spend that money, of course. That can then go toward your honeymoon or your house or your retirement, you know, things, savings. Yeah. Um, but I totally agree. Like there, we have some venues in this area where if they're going to store your wedding cake, there's a fee mm-hmm. because there's a you know there's a liability associated with that. But I'm guessing that that isn't something that comes up unless you ask them about storing your wedding cake. Yeah, and you know that's not them hiding a fee. It's just maybe they don't think to tell you. There are some things that might come up like that where you just don't realize, or you know maybe. Um, even something silly, like maybe one of your parents ends up like needing a little bit of extra support to get there. Mm. And you have that flexibility to do that too. That is interesting. I would never would have thought about the the cake. What is it? Storage fee? Like, wow. (laughs) So yeah, Yeah. you really want to give yourself buffer for those things. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, it, I think at the venue I'm specifically thinking of, I'm photographing there again this weekend, actually. Um, but <laughs> um, I think it's $300 a day. Oh, snap. Okay. Yeah. So it can be, you know, there can be, and, and again, I don't think it's a hidden fee. Mm-hmm. I just think it's something you probably don't necessarily see in the contract because you're not there yet. You're yeah. booking your venue before you're doing anything else. So, you know, you don't think about it and then you get to the point where you have to ask and I mean that anything like that or travel fees, like things like that, that you just didn't map out um, or include in your budget, they can add up fast. And it could be other things too, like even like taxes on certain things, um, like could throw you off like because you think something costs a certain amount and then like, oh, the tax is like, oh, made it that like just a surprise or even tip. You know, because there's a lot of yeah. you know, the service industry. There's a lot of people that you're probably going to tip. Like all these things are like kind of like a hidden, but not they're not true hidden expenses. But you don't think about them. You know, why when you're writing yes, down to exactly. rental line items, you're not thinking that. So that's why you want kind of like a miscellaneous part of that budget. Yeah. Oh, I also had um, 
sorry, now that I'm thinking about fees, um, I also had a 60-year-old cousin of one of my couples brought a guest, like a plus one without having a plus one. Um, it's extra interesting because it's a 60-year-old. So, <laughs> um, But that ended up costing them like over $250 because, you know, there's the beverage, there's the food, the catering fee, um, then the tip out on that and a last minute fee because they had to scrounge yeah. to get a meal for that person. I remember like meet girl, mean girls. You can't sit with us. <laughs> That's a lot of stress they, the last minute. Like, mm-mm. Yeah. I was walking with my couple and they both looked at me and they were like, that person was not invited to our wedding. We don't know who that person is. Like, Okay. Yeah, they updated me later because I was really curious. <laughs> yeah, that's not a pleasant surprise. But yeah, more more reason for your buffer. Yes, yes, definitely buffer. Um, lots of unexpected things. Mm. Um, so what are some creative ways to cut costs on wedding attire and accessories without sacrificing style? So yeah, we're not, we're not aiming to make you look cheap here, right? So if you have a style you want to maintain, um, there are things you can do to help decrease costs. One, I mean, most people, I feel like heard of this already, but maybe people still don't know that like you could rent your dress. Okay. Mm-hmm. And the beauty of it is, okay, I didn't rent mine, right? But because I wanted it custom, but I told myself, I was like, oh, you know, after I get married, I'm going to make this into a party dress and I'm going to wear it. I'm 11 years in, haven't touched that dress once. Okay. So if you think you're going to regret it, you're not. <laughs> Just say it. From my personal experience, I'll tell you, you're not. I had all intentions to use that dress again. So it's literally something that goes, and even the way the, the dry cleaner boxes it up, it makes it so like, I don't want to touch it even. Yeah. You don't even want to open it. I'm just like, I have to pull it out from a garage. It's a lot. Um, other more simple ways to, <laughs> other more simple ways to like, um, you know, have, uh, keep your style, but like less expensive. Of course, people, the stuff you, a lot of people do every day, like they're shopping, like think about like. Maybe you want something like, you know, it, think about the, something old, something blue. Like these are like the, those same ideas. Like they could be something borrowed from a family member, an heirloom. Like these are all things that don't necessarily have to cost a lot of money, but could still make you look very good. So those are kind of like the easier things to think of. Um, of course, too, just planning ahead. Once you have decided like what your budget is for your dress, try not to try on the more expensive dresses because you're going to pick it. Okay. Our emotions, yeah. our emotions get into it. So, you know, whatever you have to do to protect yourself against your emotions, because the thing is, the odds of you regretting that decision is much higher than you actually sticking to the budget that you actually chose. So, yeah, I could see that totally. I also told myself that I was going to potentially sell my dress. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't do yeah. that. Um I did think about selling it again recently, and I have been married for 12 years, so you and I are in the same boat. Um, Mine is at my parents' house, so it's just occupying their space. This is what I'm saying. Like, you have all the intentions and the feelings when when you're getting married, and then it's like, now it's real life, and I don't have time for this. Like, I just really don't. Yeah. And I am not fitting back in that dress. Not that I'm like significantly bigger, Mm -hmm. but my body is just not the same as it was. It's not shaped the same anymore. Things change when you get older, guys. I mean, I didn't want to believe it. That was even different. Like, I mean, I love my dress and I still, when I look at the pictures, I I love it. But I'm like, how would I possibly wear that in a casual setting today? Like, I just do not see it happening. Like, I just thought, yeah, hey, we just cut it. But I'm like, it's very, like, detailed. I'm like, where am I wearing this exactly? Yeah. And you can't wear it to somebody else's wedding. No, absolutely not. <laughs> Even if you dye it, you probably can't wear yeah. it to somebody else's wedding. So just to, you know, ha- flag that idea as being probably not. Um, I also thought about using it as a Halloween costume. Mm. But I don't know what I would have. Been. I don't want to be like the bride of that's, Frankenstein. That's what I thought that came to my head too. I'm like, what else could it? What else would you put it? Like, what else would it be? 
I mean, for reference, this year I'm being Austin Powers, and last year I was Poison Ivy, the Batman villain. <laughs> Bride of Frankenstein really isn't my vibe. That's so funny. <laughs> yeah. I mean, those other tips though of like getting like heirlooms and stuff, like it could really add like a really personal touch. You know, your family will be appreciative if it's something like that's in your family, like and that gets to be part of your wedding pictures and you get to think about it all the time. Like there's a lot of value in that. So it's not to say for people like if you want to get the dress, get the dress, okay? But if you never knew that renting was an option, if you never thought of like some people now, I feel like people just buy regular dresses sometimes for their wedding, mm -hmm. like so that they yeah. actually can wear it again, you know? Yeah. So these are all just options. Just you know, people know, be creative. Yes. Think outside the box. You also, they have amazing secondhand stores. Oh, yeah. Um, you can sell your dress, but I do want to say it is much harder to execute it than it is to think you will do it um, 12 years later. Uh -huh. I um, I did not spend much on my dress, but, um, you know, so it's probably not worth a ton either. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so think outside the box. You don't have to go to those expensive – places to try stuff on. The experience is fun no matter what, even if you're like going over to a friend's house to try on dresses that you get from one of the rental places. Like it's still a super fun experience. And honestly, it might be more fun than going to those. I did not enjoy the bride oh, the, uh, wedding dress trying on. It was hot. It was awful. I was getting unsolicited opinions from other people's families. Oh. I was, and then it was awkward. They were like, "So, are you going to go with the one we like?" And I'm like, "But I didn't like that I don't one." I know and then, you. Yeah, my husband wouldn't like that one. I also am one of those people who everyone talks to, so there's the possibility that mm -hmm. it's partially that. That's funny. I am sometimes that person, which I don't get why, because my face never, to me, looks like people sometimes say I look unapproachable, and yet everybody approaches me. I don't know what it is. So. I, as someone who has approached you and who distracted you for like, what, 30 minutes before we started recording this podcast um, and just chit-chatted with you, I would say you are very approachable and you're super fun to talk to. You like have really insightful things to say. Thank which you. Is, yeah. I mean, that's why we're friends, yeah. right? <laughs> Can couples balance their wedding budget with their long-term financial goals? Because this is something that is so, so important, like saving for a home, mm. um, not running credit card debt, and um, and also like putting money into your retirement yes. and, and not pulling money out of your retirement for this. Please. Please. <laughs> Just say <saying>. Please. <laughs> so overall, like – our main things is communication and then prioritization. I mean, the thing is, at any given point at anyone's life, you're balancing multiple, you know, financial goals. Okay, there's a vacation here. There's a family member I need to help with this or that. So it means literally sitting down and creating some intention. Okay, what is most important here? And then let's get started on like how are we going to do this together, right? So um, both of you guys need to sit down and figure out what is like important for you guys create like a shared vision is what this is coach called Rami Sethi. That's how he always says it, your shared vision. And that way it becomes less contentious. Um, ideally, you know, cause you would have done this in wedding planning. So if your shared visions are already like, you might save yourself a ton of money by not getting married at all. But, <laughs> but, but if you do choose that, then you're like, even for myself, like when I, when I was going to get married, that was one of my big things. Like, even though at the time I was not great with money at all, but I knew that I didn't, I knew that, you know, marriages suffer when it comes to the finances. So I was like, I didn't want any of that melodrama. I was like, I wanted minimal cost. Like that was what I valued. Like, yeah, I want to have a party, but I don't want anything flashy. I don't want anything too extravagant because I want my life with my husband more so than that day to be so expensive and extravagant. So that's something you guys have to do. And then once you decide like, okay, this is what is a priority, you can kind of see how you're going to allocate your funds, right? Okay. So now every paycheck, this is how much is going to go to this goal, how much is going to go to this goal, how much goes to this goal. 
buying a home right after you get married, I wouldn't highly recommend because there's just so many moving parts. It's very stressful. Buying a home is very yeah. stressful. I didn't anticipate yeah. it um, being because it's so like normalized, like society, like, oh, buy a house, buy a house. It is the most annoying process. I Oh my God. I thought it would be so fun from watching all of those shows yes. like House Hunters. No. It is not fun. It sometimes it takes three months to trench your internet to your phone. <laughs> it's so intense. And then too, like they they the I'm a I'm I'm pretty sure part of it is my personality where I'm just like once I've done my part, I feel like I should be done with you. Why are you asking me a month later for new stuff? Oh, and documents that you can't find at work. They're not like you have to go home to find yeah. them and you need them within like six hours. So like if you just got to work, what are you going to yeah, do? I can't. So it's it's way more complicated. So I would highly – so this is time to – like if you do know that you want a home in your future, to so like, okay, this is how much we can set aside. But you could like make that number smaller and then after the wedding, because that cost is gone, then you could increase – you could take that money that you were putting towards the wedding and just move it to be the house fund. I think that's just a, a clever way people don't think to like just this structure your money so that way you can keep doing those things. And usually saving for retirement happens separately just because most people have it through their jobs. So that'll happen. But if you plan on being a stay at home mom, um, there is an option too for a spousal IRA. So that would be a, something you could discuss with your mate where they could put money for you in an IRA, your own retirement account, okay? Just because you're a stay-at-home mom doesn't mean you don't need to get your own money, okay? Mm -hmm. So those are options. So these are things to discuss ahead of time. You know, create that plan. And then you're always going to have to meet regularly to update that plan well after marriage, like forever pretty yes. much. Yeah, like I have a self-employment um, IRA, mm -hmm. like a SEP yeah. IRA um, that I contribute to every year. Um, you should have retirement plans, yes. <laughs> please. And and not just rely – the other thing is like I, one of my family members found out the hard way, you can't always rely on your pension. Mm -hmm. If that company, even if it's a huge company that you would never in a million years think could file for bankruptcy, Jeez. does, it can cut your pension from $1,200 a month to $200 a month. Yikes. Yeah. And if you worked for that company for like – 35, 40, whatever years, it's really hard. So just don't like – don't – it's it's better to be safe than sorry. But I love what you said about reallocating the money that you are monthly allocating toward the wedding budget to just re, uh, reallocating that into your house hunting budget. Yeah. And then um, – because then you're not changing your lifestyle that you had during the wedding planning process mm -hmm. and it seems a little bit less of a jump. And – I mean, if you can find a home, of course, now I'm sure this feels very overwhelming to everyone because house hunting is, yeah. is a very lot right now. It's been in the last couple of years. Yeah, it's been a little bit harder. I We snuck in this house before all of that, um, but going through, yeah, it's um, it's interesting now. Um, so I, I feel you all in my soul um, that are thinking about this, but um, – it will get easier again. Um, so still, you know, putting that money aside, um, I would also encourage you to put a lot more money aside than you think you need oh, yeah. because you do have to furnish that house as well. Yes. I just want to, I just <laughs> want to emphasize that because people really <laughs> underestimate what it takes to buy the house. You're like, they get the mortgage thinking I can cover this monthly payment, which is not a good way to pick how much your mortgage should be. It's like that you could afford the monthly payment because God forbid something happens to you. Oh, instantly. yeah. That's a problem. Um, and then like house repairs, uh, tax, taxes change all the time. They don't tell you oh, that yeah. when you buy the house. Okay. Oh, yeah. They change all the time. So your mortgage, even though for the most part, when I and that's one of the things that even prompted me to buy, a, buy well, we have a condo, to buy was because like our rent was going up. And I was like, you know what? When I get a house, that would be stable, like mortgage. To some degree, until your place makes a tax hike of like 20% if they did. And then it's like, your mortgage is all of a sudden 100, 200 more. So these are all things to like think about. Nobody like tells you this, honestly. Oh, 
HOA. Yeah. See, but I, 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 I factored that sucker in though, because that's why we, when we picked our place, another good tip. I know we're talking about weddings mostly, but this is good because you guys are going to, a lot of people are going to buy homes. When, yeah. um, when we picked our place, we intentionally picked a place with a low HOA fee because we knew yeah. it would go up over time. So the people who chose, like, so I'm, I'm trying to remember what our mortgage was at the time. I know what it is now. It's like $1,400, which doesn't that sound like stealing? I just love it. That honestly does. <laughs> oh my God. I think mine is like three times that. <laughs> Oh, I just love it. It was it was such a great time to buy. I just love it. But um, when so our mortgage is that much, and then our HOA fee is. I do this on auto pay now, so this is why I'm like thinking about it. But it's like yeah, ours is too. Yeah, it's like let's say, let's just for math sake, five hundred dollars. It's around that thing. But when we started, it was more like two fifty, three hundred, and we've been here. I'm gonna say six years, and it goes up pretty much a lot clockwork every year. But like some of the places we were looking at, their HOA fees were like $900. Hmm. Who knows what theirs is now? Like they might be paying more than my mortgage and HOA fees at this point because of how things increase. So you want to give yourself that wiggle room. Like even your utilities, you have no control over a lot of times over what those are going to cost. There are some places where you could like negotiate these kind of things. But other times it's not even worth the hassle. And then you just wind up you know, paying whatever PSCNG or whoever your provider is just gives you. And it's just like, so all these things, nobody factors in these things, repairs, maintenance, and please maintain your home. That way oh, have yeah. To, to many repairs. Just. Oh my gosh. Yes. Please maintain your home. Don't let it get to the point where, you know, if you have a leak, like water is the most, we, I mean, <laughs> of course now we're going down like a rabbit hole. <laughs> Please fix. Please maintain your house. It saves you so much money in the future. Um, oh my gosh. It's just, yeah. Um, staying out in front of it saves you. I mean, yeah. Thinking about some of the unexpected things that have happened to us yeah. in home ownership. So many. Prepare for the unpreparable. <laughs> the unexpected. Yeah. Yeah. We're a personal property state. Mm-hmm. So we or Commonwealth technically. Um, so we pay pro, uh, like anything that we have, our income tax is low, um, but we have to pay for cars. Um, we Like you pay a tax every year on your car and what the value is of your car. Whoa. It's, still, it's still lower than what you – what we would pay if we still lived in DC. Okay. Um, it's significantly lower. Well, also, we were a one car family for 17 okay. years. We just got a new car in May. That's um, interesting. I've never even heard of this concept. Yeah. So there are a lot of states that are like that. Um, so just, you know, as like when you're house hunting, you should also look at what taxes are in that state mm-hmm. if you're looking in a different state than what you already live in. Because that is one of the reasons we moved to Virginia in from DC, because we could afford more in Virginia. Um, we're still, we're less than a mile from the DC line. Nice. Um, but we have two more stories on this house than we could have afforded in DC mm-hmm. based on income taxes and um, general taxes. Oh, yeah. In, yeah. A beautiful it, way to game the system. I know. I mean, they're going to get their money somehow. Yeah. So that's what personal property tax does. But, you know, like there are people on our street that have like four cars and I just think they must be paying a lot yeah. in taxes. <laughs> Uh, moving right along, yeah. what are some effective strategies for setting and maintaining a budget as a married couple? So after your wedding, you've budgeted for your wedding, you've reallocated that wedding planning money into your retirement. What are some effective strategies from that point on for setting and maintaining a budget? So first off, I know people are like, by the word budget, a budget doesn't have to be like something that says you can only spend $10 on toilet paper every month. Okay. It doesn't yeah, have to be- it doesn't have to confine. Yeah. It can just it just gives you an idea of like where your money is going, and that you're it's going where you want it to go. Okay, mm-hmm. that you're doing it on purpose. You're moneying on purpose. Okay, so just to be clear on that. So first off is having clear financial goals. 
So, you know, what is your priority at this time? You know, is it family? Is it vacations? Is it um, adventure? Is it maybe you're going back to school? Maybe um, there's a lot of things like want to make sure that you guys are both on the same page as to what those goals are. That doesn't necessarily mean you have to manage your funds together. I know some people are like anti that, like, oh, the monies have to all mix. It's not necessary, but you also do want to have open communication, right? So like, Every time I get a raise, I tell him I, I make sure he knows about it. He knows what accounts I have, you know, like, because first of all, too, if I die, I don't want the man to get the money. I want my husband to get the money. So it's oh, important yeah. for everybody to be on the same page. And then like whatever system you create for your funds, whether it's together or separately, that you guys both know what that is. So like my budget is a very simple one. Like every paycheck, I drop it, the amount in the spreadsheet, and it calculates based on something I decided ages ago, since last year, I've been using the same system. Um, and I change it depending on our money situation. And um, like, it says how much is going towards the house, how much is going towards my short term savings, which is like stuff like shopping, vacations, um, unexpected, like, I would say little, little expenses, like car maintenance and stuff. Then long term savings, which is always investing for me, or emergency fund for him. So that's how we kind of like separate it. My my long term and his long term are two separate, like, just goes two separate ways. Um, and then duh, 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 and spending. So that means that's the money that's going to pay off all the cards that I spent all the time that I swiped that month. So it's that makes it very simple. And he's aware of my system and it, he makes me aware of his system. So we're all on the same page here. The other thing is, you know, we're going to evolve and change as humans, right, over the years. And so those conversations need to happen. Right. And it needs to be a safe space for the person to share. Like, okay, you know, well, maybe like 10 years down the line, they're like, I want to go back to school. And you're like, whoa, I was not planning. <laughs> I was not expecting that. But no, instead, like, let's hear them out and then say, like, figure out, like, is this something that we could realistically do together? You know? And then sometimes it does work out where it's like, okay, maybe we can make it work. And other times, maybe it's something we have to defer. But without having those conversations at all, it's going to create such a train wreck. So those are like the main things, regularly checking in. So people sometimes have weekly money dates, depending on your lifestyle. Maybe that's too often. Maybe it's not enough. Maybe you need it more often, like especially if funds are tighter and you need to be more watchful. You may want to, you know, check in more often. It doesn't have to be a full like sit down for like 30 minutes, an hour and like, let's talk money. It should be a fun, relaxed thing. Like, listen, let's strategize because we're going to beat this money game. Gamify it. I love yes. that. <laughs> and like another piece of this, what you're not saying, but you are saying is don't hide money stuff from your significant Please. other. Please. It's not, it's not fun. Okay. No. And it creates a, a level of distrust that's very challenging. I actually know someone who's kind of doing that. And um, I'm like, like I think the like the significant other was looking to check the bank accounts and she was terrified out of her mind. Who wants to live like that? You know? It's just so much extra anxiety that is not necessary. And like it might be difficult to have the conversation, but the amount of time that you wake up stressing mm -hmm. out about hiding something from your partner is so much worse. Yeah. Like I I I cannot live like that. Like I would never hide something unless it's like a, a surprise yeah. or something great. Um, I'm great at that. Although I, then I'm like vibrating with excited energy. <laughs> you can clearly tell. Um, but <laughs> otherwise, like I would never hide something from my partner or my husband because I wouldn't be able to deal with the stress mm -hmm. surrounding the secret. Yeah. Um, and, and the consequence – of having the secret, for me, it the conversation. It's just so it's so much easier to do that than like to damage the relationship and to have to unweave all of the lie oh, yeah. that requires mm -hmm. to maintain it. Oh, yeah. um, so please don't do that. Um, I think that can be a real place where you start down the road of not trusting each other. Um, and it's really scary to be on either side of that, either the person who finds out that something was hidden or the person who, um, you know, yep. is hiding. hiding. <laughs> both, both, both are tough. Yeah. Um, 
And yeah, I mean, and of course, like we all make mistakes. I'm going to be honest here. I have been having the worst time moving my old Roth and traditional IRAs. The company is like really trying not to let me move them. Mm. Um, it's a it's very complicated. It's in my maiden name because it was open before we got married, and it's we've been married twelve years, and I take like year long breaks from dealing with this because <laughs> it's just such a pain in the butt. Um, and mentally, I need to, but like my husband knows that I'm taking a break from it, and he'll ask me about it, and I'm like, oh god, yes. He asked me in this weekend. I was like, oh god, yes, I need to do this again. Yeah. I'm so sorry. I promise I will get on this. Um, and then it like reminds me, okay, I need to actually do this. Um, like put on your big girl pants, Sarah. Um, <laughs> but you know, we have an open, honest relationship, so it's not like I'm hiding that yeah. money. But he's also not the beneficiary of that money, so it really does need to move because otherwise it goes 50-50 to my parents and my brother is the backup, mm. which like at least it's going to somebody. Yeah. But like that's not a great situation. My parents would want to give him the money and then incur the taxes. It's yeah, not a good situation. Mess. I think even yeah. though – I mean that's not – but even though you're not banking with them, you should still be able to change the beneficiary. Yeah, I sh- I I can. Yeah. I just want to move the money. So Gotcha. <laughs> to like our joint accounts. I gotcha. <laughs> so I'm like if I change the beneficiary it's going to take me longer to execute <laughs> on the- I know my I dig it. I gotcha. The other thing I wanted to note too in terms of like sharing and spending and all that stuff is that um, one thing that uh, a lot of people, especially people who manage their funds separately, but even sometimes people who manage their funds together find this useful is knowing, giving yourselves a threshold, an agreed threshold for when you will say, hey, I'm spending this money, right? So um, some people is like, oh, $100, anything over $100, anything over $200, anything over $500, but you pick that number. So that way, when you spend under it, and that doesn't mean you spend under it consecutively every day. Okay. We just say like, you know, like, oh, if I got buy, buy concert tickets and it's this much that I'll have to report it. I hate saying report. It sounds like so official, but you know, like not everything warrants a discussion if you set those kind of standards. So you guys together are coming up with the standards of your relationship as to what uh, needs a conversation and what doesn't. But at the crux of it all is communication. Yeah, that's such an interesting thing. We don't have that in our house, but we do that. Mm-hmm. I bought two carpets and I was like, you're okay with me spending X amount on these area rugs, correct? Yeah. He's like, yeah, we need them. Like, yeah, we like them. Yeah. Um, or if we're buying like baseball tickets, something we don't really do concerts, um, but we do like sporting events, mm-hmm. um, then my husband will turn to me and be like, you're okay with me spending X amount on these tickets, right? But I never have thought about that as being like a strategy. And that's mm-hmm. so interesting. Um, and it actually feels good because it makes you gut check yourself. Like, am I comfortable yeah. spending this? Like, is this worth it? And if it's not, then I'll use – because there are times when I think something's worth it mm-hmm. and it's not. And when I say it out loud – I don't need him to say anything mm-hmm. about it. I realize, like, okay, you're spending like way more. Like, can we maybe wait until a sale comes yeah. to get those carpets? Or, um, you know, like we're buying when we were buying a car, we targeted Memorial Day weekend mm-hmm. because or Memorial Day sales. They're like the big sales every year. Oh yeah. Um, so we can, like wait it out. Um, and actually, my phone needs to be upgraded. Um. And we're waiting it out until September after September 20th because that's when Apple drops the new phone or releases the ah. new phone. So we'll be able to get – yeah. <laughs> that's awesome too because like as – because you guys – the thing is with conversing with someone is that you guys have different perspectives. You have different life experiences. So like sometimes like even though, you know, me and my husband too have been married 11 years, like he'll think of something. I'm like, I would have never thought to do it that way. Or maybe something even in my own head too much. It's like, oh, here's a simple solution. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> so it's good to have that communication. You never like it, it like what is it? There's a there's a there's benefit in multiple advisors, you know, they say like so like yeah. yeah, communicate, talk. And if you can't talk to your partner, we have bigger problems. Yes, yes. Um yes. 
that is a um, speak with your mental health professional <laughs> situation. Very wonderful. All the strategy there. <laughs> Um, how can couples navigate financial disagreements to ensure that they're on the same page about money? So, you know, we're human, so we're not always going to agree on things. Um, first off, of course, we've been talking about communication a lot. That's a big deal. Um, mm-hmm. If we disagree on how the money is expended, like we want to get to the root of why this is even a disagreement. Because the fact of the matter is, if the money is there, why can't we do it? Well, there may be a reason. Maybe one of the money values that you guys have determined at the beginning is changing for one of you guys, and that needs to be discussed. Um, Maybe there's something triggering is happening where like a lot of people really underestimate how much, how they grew up and how they interacted with money and the things that are supposed to money are actually in their everyday lives. And so everybody feels like money is supposed to be just a logical thing. Oh, I don't have this money, so I can't spend it. Obviously, nobody lives like that, but people think that's what they're supposed to do. But it's and it is what you're supposed to do, but that's not how our emotions work. That's not how our mind works a lot of times. So some things maybe like in childhood, every time after work, your mom would go to, you know, McDonald's and get a, a sandwich. And then so like to you, it's like normal to do that, despite the fact that that maybe that doesn't align with your values or maybe you just had a bad day at work and it was nostalgic to you. There's a bunch of different things that come into play. But the only way we could ever get to the root of it is to have these conversations. And a lot of people don't have really, you know, full fleshed out money discussions. And the thing is, that's going to also affect how you communicate. Maybe even too, if your parents never talked about money growing up, you might find it very weird to talk to your partner about money now. It's like, what does that make you obsessed? Like, what do you keep talking about it for? It's like, no, like this is normal. I know it was different where you grew up, but we should be talking about it. <laughs> But how many things did we think were normal or don't think are normal from when we were growing up and we were wrong? Yes. You live, you learn, honey. (laughs) (laughs) So ideally, you want to find common ground, you know, you really want to be empathetic in this, in the circum, in the conversation, especially if the person is opening up to you, you want to be empathetic and like, listen, and like really try to talk through with your partner versus at your partner. Um, That way you guys can come up with a solution that works for the both of you. And that, and like we said before about you, like having these aligned vision, your aligned goals, like the reason the discrimination ha- happens is because for whatever reason, that's diverging. Let's get back to that. So we can almost even think about preventing it even by having regular money check-ins in that, because you can catch these things sooner than versus when like someone just, <laughs> I saw an episode of a thing where this person all of a sudden decided to go to grad school and he was like, whoa, like where'd that come from? Like it's like but if you've been talking about it the entire time like this is going to happen then it would be less shocking so these are the kind of things that you know we talk about to keep the drama to a minimum yeah oh my gosh heading off problems at the pass Mm -hmm. is always easier than writing the course big time Oh, well, thank you so much for joining me on The Wedding Dish today, Prisca. Where can our listeners find you online? So I have my blog, www.ourgreenlifenj.com. And I can be found pretty much on all the socials, but I live mainly on Instagram at ourgreenlifenj. And that NJ is New Jersey, just for reference of like what that letter is. (laughs) What those letters are. There are two of them. Yes. <laughs> They're not the same. Yeah, it's not and J. It's N J. <laughs> I love it. Um well, while you are finding Prisca, and she does, she shares so many amazing facts and tips and things on both her Instagram and on her blog post. Actually, and in your newsletter yeah. too. Um, you share tons of really good information that really just like makes money management feel I don't know. Maybe it's gamified mm-hmm. some of it. I do um, kind of a feel little... like I mean, I don't feel like I present it that way, but I do behave that way. <laughs> because <laughs> it... like a lot of people feel like it's so complicated. And I'm like, we can have fun with this. Like it doesn't need to be so stressful. It doesn't need to be so like calculated and emotionless. Like money should be fun. You know, and I know that's not going to be the case every single second of every single day. But the more you interact with your money, the easier it is for you to manage. And then like when things do come up, 
I mean, the stress levels are like so like minute. Like I was one of the examples in this video, I don't know, a lot of people liked it, um, where like my building, ever since we moved in, we moved in, in 2015. They've been talking about repairing this elevator. Okay. And then all of a sudden last year, boom, this time has come. Okay. <laughs> there was, and then the two options were to pay monthly. And then when I did the math, it would have been three grand more than just paying it all up front, which was like about like 9,000 something dollars. And I'm like, okay, well, let's see. At the time, we, my husband's work was iffy. So it's like, do we play it safe? Maybe we do do the monthly, even though it's going to cost us a uh, disgusting extra $3,000, but maybe that makes the most sense right now. Um, but uh, we do have the money. Uh, we do have emergency funds, right? We have money set aside for when things pop up that we can use and then we could replenish. So these are things you can have like a chill conversation about instead of, oh my God, this bill is here. And it was like, literally like they gave us like a month or two to figure it out. Like pick your, pick your poison. <laughs> Wow, yeah. that is unexpected. Yeah. Um, like we knew it was going to happen, but when, how much, we had no clue. So oh by, by taking good control of your money, the entire because we had good control of our money, we had a good money system, we could have the conversation and really sit down and do the math without like panic, you know? And that's kind of what I want for people. Like it doesn't, this doesn't have to be a stressful game. And I didn't know that, but I did learn over the years. And now that's why I imparted to others. I love that. I love that. So follow and visit rgreenlifenj.com slash at rgreenlifenj. And while you are following Prisca, you can find us at The Wedding Dish Podcast um, on Instagram and our website. The, we will link out to all of the things so you can easily find Prisca and get her money strategies and tips and all of the things expertise um, on our show notes at theweddingdishpodcast.com. And um, if you like the show, give us a follow, rate, and review on your favorite podcasting app. We don't care which one. We just appreciate when you do. Um, and Prisca, thank you so much for dishing with me today. This was such a fun conversation. And um, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Cheers, everybody. Fun. Thanks. Thanks.